Occultism has always been linked to intelligence networks and revolutionary movements. And there are specific reasons for that. One of the reasons is lowering inhibitions. So especially in past centuries, uh, many people were afraid of God and they uh, still had a sense of loyalty towards these old um, empires. And once you lower people's inhibitions, you can get them to become assets and take part in, in actual operations. So first of all, you want people to think subversive thoughts, uh, to think new thoughts. And in certain rituals, um, stories are being acted out. It's, it's, part of it is like play acting, but by simulating uh, a certain thing, you can lower the inhibitions so that these um, occultist members will actually do these things in the real world. And once these members uh, no longer are afraid of uh, God, they may become afraid of um, demonic forces or very mysterious forces. And um, so not only do occultists pledge allegiance to the group, they also pledge allegiance to these mysterious forces. And uh, so the threat not only exists that uh, the group will uh, could harm you if you prove to be not loyal, but also these forces um, could um, could harm you. So you see this a lot before revolutions. Um, there is quite a bit of uh, occult activity. And once the revolution is done, um, most uh, most groups are actually shut down, uh, especially if uh, especially the larger groups, so that the new government, the new system, uh, can uh, prevent the danger of um, all kinds of occultist groups plotting um, against this this new order. So before the French Revolution, there was a lot of occultism, and the British intelligence made sure to fan those flames. But in Britain itself. Uh, Freemasonry, for example, was was very, very conservative and other groups were under a strict uh, control. Uh, the right wing circles uh, in Germany and Austria for a long time, uh, for quite a while in the 1800s, uh, the right wing circles were very occultic, very, occult, uh, very many occult groups. But once the Nazis actually took power, uh, almost all of these occult groups were made illegal. So it was only the official state groups and some specific exceptions. Uh, same with the communists. Um, the communist movement for a long time was very, very occult. And then after the revolution, uh, almost nobody was allowed to um, practice occultism or have any sort of group because the communist government wanted to control all groups. Within the communist system, uh, there was still, of course, a, a strong... Uh, strong threat of occultism, especially in the KGB. And you can see sort of um, the occultism in the art uh, and communism is very psychedelic, very strange. Um, and also the Lenin mausoleum, when he died and was put to rest, um, this mausoleum was basically an ancient temple. So you can still see those traces if you know where to look. Uh, nowadays, of course, Russia is marketing itself as a Christian Roman Empire. Uh, they are supposedly fighting occultism. And uh, at the same time, in Russia, you do still have these uh, ancient mystery cults from the Eastern Roman Empire that became a really big thing in Russia. Um, and um, there's also below those ancient mystery cults in Russia, there's kind of this mid-level of occultism which has uh, grown out of control. And then there's the occultism in the lower of the lower levels for the masses. And this has reached a, uh, a, a vast size in Russia today. So many, many people actually pay for the services of occult healers and, and advisors and such. And uh, now we see that Russia is trying to ban certain occultist groups. They cannot ban everything overnight because the phenomenon is just too big in Russia. And um, there's uh, public accusations um, from high ranking officials in Russia, uh, accusations that the West uh, is uh, using occult groups to uh, uh, to do sabot acts of sabotage within uh, within Russia. Simultaneously, the Russians are using occultism 
um, against the West. They're trying to gain followers and they are recruiting people in right wing circles in Europe and in the United States. So this occult phenomenon is always linked to intelligence operations. It's always linked to uh, revolutionary movements. So who is an expert on this topic? Well, it gets kind of complicated. Uh, the academics are usually very, very tame, and uh, they oftentimes know very little about intelligence operations. Uh, they There are experts on religious matters who have published texts on the mid-level occultist groups. And um, uh, most of these texts are very apologetic, so they try to be a very understanding and try to be nice and of course there are harmless occultists out there um, that's pretty clear but um, it's it's really hard to uh, find one expert who really really understands this topic so it's always advisable to pool different studies and to combine different um, uh, different works and and try to piece together what is actually going on uh, on the internet you see a bunch of material and usually this material you see on the web is really faulty. There's a lot of false information uh, around and this stuff gets copied over and over again. Uh, so people read this stuff, they watch these videos and then they put together some sort of a mixtape. They take these bits and they rearrange them a bit and they, um, they put this stuff together and republish it and uh, many market themselves as experts on the topic when they are not experts. Uh, I, you see people quoting um, quoting Kathy O'Brien a lot, which is a problem. Uh, you see people quoting Fritz Springmeier a lot, which is also a problem. Uh, so if you see that as source material, you are not really dealing with an expert um, because uh, Kathy O'Brien was sort of brainwashed by her uh, boyfriend, I think later husband. Uh, I have looked into this uh, uh, very deeply and um, it's 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 not really something you should use as a source. Uh, Fritz Springmeier has never been an expert really on anything and he has largely been forgotten for the most part, but his material on uh, what what's commonly referred to as mind control, his stuff is still out there and it's being copied over and over again. Um, so, um, you have these three baseline levels of occultism. You have these elite ancient mystery cults, and then you have the mid-level, and then you have the lower levels. And the more elite occultism is, the worse uh, the actual source material is, which is understandable. Um, so, even in ancient times, uh, you had a, a broad variety of, of these these cults and you also had these different levels and some of these cults were mainstream, very benign and mid-level cults got stranger and stranger and then of course you had the very very elite cults such as the Mithras cult. Now to this day no text has uh, is publicly available about what was going on in these small weird temples of the Mithras cult. Uh, archaeologists have found these um, these places, but they are really, really small. And you can only look at the artwork and try to guess what this is about, where it came from. Uh, some of the most powerful people were part of this Mithras cult, and it's really strange that they would pick these secluded places. Not grand temples, but very, very well hidden. Uh, could be in the forests, could be in somebody's basement, uh, like in Italy or today's Italy, um, or um, built into existing caves. Um, this is something you need to remember. Um, now we can guess what was going on in these in in these uh, in these places of uh, of ancient mystery cults, and they they try to gain access to the forces of the gods and the demons. Uh, this is something that the general population was doing as well. So, for example, if your kids got sick uh, in ancient Rome, it was uh, common to perform complicated rituals involving little dolls and pigs, and you had to dress up the pig and all that. Uh, and then when this little figurine was, um, was ready, so to speak, it was placed next to the bed of the sick child and they expected that um, 
these forces would then help the child. Now, it was not just benign gods that were uh, called on to help. It was also demons or, you know, entities that were regarded as um, sort of evil. But if you do the ritual right, they thought you could still use their power for your own uh, your own purposes. Now, if you talk about high level individuals, people who conduct warfare and slave populations and people who are involved in intelligence operations, which were vast, by the way, uh, in the ancient world, much greater than previously believed over the last couple of years, uh, you had some uh, new studies on that. If you're talking about individuals with that level of power and expertise, um, they uh, they were more likely psychopathic and 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 more crazy, and they used psychedelics in the rituals, and um, anything was possible in those rituals. So there was no real limitation. Um, it's it's limited what you can do in that sort of an environment, and. Uh, yeah, and the mid-level stuff, mid-level occultism, it's better documented, but most of the time, researchers, academics, they quote from the texts from these organizations. And of course, if they put anything on paper, it was self-marketing. So they they talk in a broad sense about their goals and methods, but you don't expect them uh, to really be to really be honest. Uh, and then the lower level occultism or mass movement esoterics of course you have um, quite a bit of documentation on that uh, but this low level occultism has has never been really a threat to an existing uh, to an existing empire and what people actually believe in can be shaped uh, by more powerful people so in order to control that so um, the infamous Alistair Crowley, for example, was actually a spy. Dr. Richard B. Spence from the University of Idaho looked into this case and came up with some interesting uh, material. Um, Alistair Crowley joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1898. And um, some members of this organization, uh, they had some revolutionary ideas. They wanted to reestablish the stewards, um, they wanted to put back the stewards on the throne of England. They wanted to make England Catholic again. They tried to uh, make or help Scotland and Ireland to become independent. And some of these occultists had links to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is also a secret uh, network. They were fighting for the independence of Ireland. Uh, then one of the members of the Golden Dawn was a British occultist called Samuel McGregor Mathers, and he knew Lord Bertram Ashburnham, um, who actually ran a training camp for revolutionary fighters. Mr. Crowley infiltrated these occult circles, and he figured out um, some of the secrets. Um, one of the secrets was a... Uh, a ship full of weapons that was supposed to be delivered and it was probably Crowley who got wind of it and told British intelligence. He also caused chaos in the Golden Dawn which is something very common for intelligence assets and um, and a couple of years later the Germans tried to get into this game. The Germans had also had created uh, cultist organizations and um, you had people such as Mr. Sylvester Fierek and um, and uh, this Mr. Fierek, he connected Crowley to some influential Germans and um, this is how Crowley basically infiltrated German operations. Uh, so he got some of the secrets uh, from the group and uh, Crowley also suggested, strongly suggested that the Germans should sink the Lusitania, the ship. Now, of course, that turned out to be a disaster for uh, for the Germans. And um, yeah, so the, o the infamous OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, was more or less a front organization for German intelligence. 
and uh, Theodore Royce initiated Mr. Crowley into the OTO in Berlin. And that's, that's how that went. Uh, the OTO was founded in, the OTO was created in Germany or Austria in the 1890s probably and um, the method was always kind of the same you started a new organization and then you expanded the scope of um, the scope of content so you it, it's it was supposed to be masonic it was supposed to be this system and that system and be open to everybody uh, who was interesting and at some point these groups started to create new lodges in other countries uh, in order to infiltrate these uh, these other countries. And so today, Russia accused the United States and Ukrainian intelligence of bringing Satanist cults into Russia. Putin himself described the West as dominated by Satanism. Prosecutor General Igor Krasnov has been requested to ban Satanist groups as extremists in the whole country. Um, religious extremism is a broad category in Russia. The government can't ban all these groups overnight and they don't want to ban all the groups. They want to have a certain control over that. Of course, it's possible to selectively enforce the laws and regulations uh, for that purpose. Um, it's been reported that a Russian version of the Satanic Bible uh, was banned as extremist. Uh, it's not clear yet if this is indeed uh, the text from Anton Zander LaVey, Church of Satan, from the United from the United States. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Russians are accusing the United States Department of State of infiltrating or bringing uh, Satanism into Ukraine and Russia. Um, it is explicitly stated that the U.S. government is um, is behind this. And remember this: Russia has never truly exposed anything, anything really big um, about the United States and Europe, despite the successes of um, the KGB and um, follow-up intelligence agencies. So we all know how infiltrated the West uh, was and how infiltrated we still are. Uh, so that KGB people, they ended up in the White House and even in other very high-ranking uh, circles. Yet uh, to this day, nothing big was ever really exposed concerning occultism. Okay, so if the Russians have information, they are not necessarily likely to uh, put this out in the public. At least not all of it. Um, they may use it um, in in a, in a different fashion. They may compromise somebody and or recruit somebody with this information. But still, you would expect the Russians to the Russians. Ex you would expect the Russians to expose something. You know, this would of course enhance the credibility um, of the Russian propaganda that they are the new Rome or the third Rome, and they are Christian and they're fighting evil. Uh, it could cause a witch hunt in the West. It uh, could turn America's allies against America uh, and so on. So just be aware of that. So don't get your hopes up that the Russians are going to, uh, to save you. Now, when the 1960s, the 1960s happened with all the rock music and um, and uh, new interest in the occult, it became more of a more a phenomenon. Uh, law enforcement did indeed see a larger problem arise from that. So you had all kinds of different crimes and law enforcement was not really trained to deal with the occult aspects of the crimes. They were just supposed to deal with the crime. So if this is an animal sacrifice, then the charge was animal cruelty, for example, um, or vandalism. You know, if people spray pentagrams somewhere or or that sort of thing. And uh, if, if there was an occult murder, there was a group of Satanist occultists and they actually killed someone. This was regarded as a traditional murder case. And so a lot of this, a lot of the occult aspects of crimes, uh, they were never truly recorded. They're not necessarily 
in that uh, data. So you can't just pull up all these different case files and, and uh, skim through them and look for cold aspects. Uh, it's just not in the data. Um, that makes it harder to, um, to estimate how big the phenomenon truly was. So this, this was how, especially in the United States, how the mid-level of occultism grew. Um, yeah, and then of course the uh, Church of the Church of Satan was one of uh, many phenomenons uh, in San Francisco uh, in 1966. The Satanic Bible sold 600,000 copies over the span of uh, um, a bunch of years. And um, Rolling Stone magazine did an interview with um, Anton Lavey once. Uh, this is actually a quite telling interview. So um, the reporter asks him, are you glad you opened Pandora's box? Uh, because LeVay, LeVay said, um, I promoted the idea where everybody is a god. That's a Pandora's box. I'm partly responsible for opening. I helped create this big shot-ism in everybody. And so he knows that he had a destructive effect, but he thinks it's important to destroy so then afterwards something new can be built. He said, um, he said things have to get worse before they can get better. And he uh, spent quite some time with this reporter and he kept on ranting about how much he hates people. And um, this is because of Anton LaVey's past. He was apparently not uh, handsome as a young man in school. He was probably bullied. Um, he tried to skip um, sk skip the sports uh, classes and, and all that. And he didn't truly reveal too much about his childhood, but it was probably pretty miserable. Now, the reporter tried to figure out if there was some, some singular big trauma, some big thing that happened to LeVay that turned him against humanity. Um, but apparently there was no such big single event. Um, but never underestimate bullying, never underestimate um, kind of how miserable life can be, especially for young people. And it's, it's, it's really, really um, an extra problem if, um, if there's a thousand different things happening to someone and, and they make this person miserable, but there's not this one big trauma where you can point to and uh, where you can clearly say I'm a victim because it's so many things. And I think this is a problem that, that especially many white kids um, uh, in the West are, are facing with. And, um, uh, and, and then, of course, uh, we are confronted with the notion that we all have this white privilege and there's minorities that have it worse, but everybody has uh, has to face um, some pretty significant problems that, that disrupt society. And so from the standpoint of an elite, the upper classes, of course, they want to make the average person pretty miserable. And this is supposed to be done in a way that... that uh, seems organic and, and, and doesn't seem like it's it's a an intentional program, so to say. And so LeVay says he LeVay said he had more respect for animals than for humans and he values uh, even vegetables more than uh, more than humans. This is what he. Uh, this is what he said. So, so basically, he was a victim of narcissistic bullying. Uh, he was a victim of a narcissistic mindset, and he just reacted to this with his own narcissism. So, in, instead of trying something else, trying something new, trying something better, he just picked like the easy way and um, and just just hates everybody. And and he was he was not really really constructive, um, constructive in that way. According to LeVay, most Satanists are stigmatized as youths. And um, this is something, uh, th there's some truth to that. So as, again, the bullying and, and all these uh, thousands of little issues and problems uh, that make, make young people so miserable. Um, of course, if you have a very unhappy childhood or a, yeah, a, a depressing childhood, you can end up an extremist any sort of extremist, but of course also in an occultist. 
he talked about his horror of going to the gym with the other boys, which was so great he managed to get a doctor's excuse to avoid it. He said he spent his gym periods in the clinic eyeing the sexy school nurse. Um, and uh, yeah, this is also something uh, you saw in J.K. Rowling, who wrote the Harry Harry Potter series. Uh, she was also very depressed, very unhappy as a kid. Uh, apparently didn't like her father. The mother got ill. And at some point, J.K. Rowling was suicidal. So she had to live with the average uh, folks. And uh, she escaped into these fantastic stories written by mostly Freemasons. And um, and that was her escapism. And at some point, she wrote the first Harry Potter novel, which is very, very Masonic. Even high-ranking Freemasons, especially the Scottish Masons, um, they... Uh, they clearly stated that everything about Harry Potter is Masonic and there's nothing in it that's not <laughs> that's not Masonic. And uh, so um, high ranking people from the publishing world and then the Hollywood, um, they picked up the story and, and made it into this uh, super phenomenon. And then finally, J.K. Rowling was J.K. Rowling was able to live among the circle of uh, more high ranking people. You know, mostly Freemasons, probably. And uh, uh, of course, in the story, Her the character of Harry Harry Potter is is very unhappy. He uh, doesn't know why his parents truly died, and he has to live with the Dursleys, who are horrible. He has no friends. His clothing is is uh, secondhand, and it's oversized, and um, and he hates his life basically. And then he gets into contact with the with the, the magical world which is of course secretive and then he gets inducted into this world and he has to be loyal to the magical world he cannot reveal the existence um, of the witches and wizards and so um yeah this is this is also kind of the link as i mentioned earlier between uh, occultism and revolutionary movements so if people are very miserable which happens in every empire uh, you can pick certain people among the unhappy and uh, you can get them into occultism and then uh, let's say right-wing extremism or left-wing extremism and then you can just use them for destruction revolution you know as LaVey said you have to destroy something before you build something new and uh, so on and so forth now of course Anton LaVey from the Church of Satan um, had a very very baseline background no special uh, family no nothing but he was hanging around people with influence such as uh, Kenneth Anger for example and uh, there's also another person involved in the founding of the Church of Satan another person that is of, of great interest it's it's a da Danish baroness called Karen de Plessen now, this is a very, very old family. It's about 1,000 years old, and they come from Saxony uh, originally, and then they uh, they uh, moved, the family moved to Mecklenburg and then Denmark. Now, these are the aristocratic lines that are most dangerous. Uh, they had, uh, they, they of course um, uh, formed what later became the the British system, the British imperial system, um, starting with uh, King George the First and and this huge cluster of, of aristocratic people, um, and uh, it's also those families who then made up the Russian throne, <clears throat> the Tsarist throne, um, and and she was probably the link between the true elite from these these elite levels um, and, and elite levels of um, ancient mystery cults. The link between those guys and then the mid-level. So the Church of Satan clearly was a mid-level organization, but uh, probably this this uh, church was started, uh, you know, with the impulse given by by someone from the elite, uh, most likely this uh, Baroness. And now, of course, you 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 do not find many ancient mystery cult ideas in the Church of Satan. And this is very typical for most mid-level organizations. They are, um, they're very baseline. They, they have the pentagrams and the, the black hoods and inverted crosses and, and anti-Christian symbology. But um, 
these ancient mystery cults, they consider themselves to be far more elite and they have um, a different view of, let's say, the devil or these dark forces because uh, they, they do not follow that Christian idea of the devil. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, LeVay had an interest in mannequins. He was collecting these mannequins and he was uh, dreaming of the future when um, robots would be made that you could use for all kinds of purposes. And um, this is something that, of course, has become true and these pleasure robots are becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, yeah, um, then uh, the connection to Michael Michael Aquino, who later went on to found the Temple of Seed, which had, of course, a more um, uh, obvious connection to ancient mystery cults. Uh, born in 1946, Michael Aquino was a military officer specializing in psychological warfare. And um, yeah, they had this, this idea of Lucifer, just like in the in the uh, the old poem by John Milton called Paradise Lost. If you read between the lines of Paradise Lost, Satan is, and and his his uh, crew is um, Satan is the secret hero of the story. And uh, this poem was actually used in a in a revolutionary uh, way in a revolutionary manner in in Britain. So this was meant to. Um, prepare people for the destruction of the old order and um this this then became of course the end of the old steward kings in in britain uh then of course aquino um aquino ha was fascinated with uh, occultism and nazism and uh, he did this ritual at the wevelsburg castle and so on and so forth it was another group founded the order of the trapezoid and um, this Order of the Trapezoid had a person called Adred Thorson, a.k.a. Stephen Flowers. Uh, he studied runology even in Germany. And um, apparently those, I mean, it, these kind of groups, they, they were more to the, to the political right and, and extreme right wing. And you always have to assume there's quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of espionage involved in that. There's a good book out um, about. It's called um, uh, "Strange Scenes Inside the Canyon." It's about this place in in uh, Los Angeles where all these famous rock bands lived and worked in the 1960s and later on. So the biggest household names and they were all involved in really really scary things. And um, uh, all of these rock musicians, they had parents from the military and the intelligence community. And so it's it's fairly clear that the establishment wanted to have this sort of new rock movement and, and rebellious um, rebellious ideas. Many important things have never been properly researched. They've never been properly reconstructed by historians and other academics. Uh, there's so many examples. Uh, for example, the infamous witch burning in witch burnings in Europe, the, the Inquisition, um, to a degree, it was about um, counter espionage. So uh, uh, not just to intimidate people, not just to uh, secure the dominant position, the monopoly of the Catholic Church at the time. Uh, it was it was to a certain degree counter espionage because even in those times um, you had sort of this mid level mid level occultism going on and as we know it's tied to espionage and subversive um, subversive movements and in all these European empires you had many many um, unhappy people especially middle class people people with more of a uh, an educational background, um, people who could be more dangerous and they could be recruited by occult groups. And so if there was any inclination that occult activity was going on, uh, it was uh, safer from the perspective of the authorities to just go in and, and be brutal. And uh, they didn't care if people were uh, swept up in this who were innocent. So it's... Uh, Counter espionage was different at the time. People couldn't just uh, get a lawyer and and refuse to answer questions, and uh, there was no internet. <laughs> there was no publicity like this. So, 
um, it was it was easier back then um, to to do counter espionage, which of course uh, made espionage so dangerous that occultism seemed like a a more extreme way. Uh, occultism seemed like a more extreme way of doing intelligence operations. So if if it has that supernatural um, uh, character to it, if it's um, if 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 everything about it seems like life or death, then it, you know members of of a certain network may be more loyal and they may believe more in the mission uh, or something like that. Then of course you had the um, the mass arrests against the Knights Templars. This is a very very infamous incident in in European history. So at some point the French king was becoming really nervous and the Pope was becoming really nervous about the Templars um, because of how much power they gained and, and wealth they had gained. And um, we all know the order was, was uh, the order members were arrested. Uh, many of them just escaped to other places and um, you saw these uh, torture sessions and show trials. Now, if you pick up any historian, uh, any historian's book on the on the matter, they will go through the old files that are available and show you how ridiculous these charges were. So, for example, uh, the baseline charge that the Templars were gay and they spat on the cross and they desecrated um, Christian symbols, um, but. The common interpretation is really, really lame. It just says that um, it was just a power struggle, and um, and that's why these Templars were arrested and charged. But what about the entire intelligence level um, attached to that incident? So, if you arrest a certain numbers of Templars, wouldn't you try uh, as as much as you can to extract information from them? You know, where are your secret networks? Where are the assets hidden? What operations are you running? All these kind of very fundamental questions. So the true charges probably differ from the charges that were on file. So they they had to have charges on file. They had to present something which fit the uh, laws at the time, um, but you would never put on paper for for public consumption uh, what the true charges were you know espionage and, and subversion and, and all that when the united states gained independence uh, the british would not just uh, drop the subject altogether they seized military military operations but everything points towards the scenario that um, the british wanted to um the British wanted to gain as much control as possible over America by covert means through intelligence uh, networks and um, by using occultism uh, that of course became uh, a huge problem and this has also never been properly researched how bad the infiltration was of the United States uh, because all these migrants came into America from Britain Scotland uh, places like Germany or certain German territories and even these various German territories they were under control of the old aristocracy and uh, especially families uh, tied to to Britain and also Russia at a certain point and um, these families they could send assets to America disguised as migrants and merchants and, and anything else you, you could imagine and this is probably where this issue arrived um, in the United States with uh, groups such as Skull and Bones, uh, which became sort of a backbone of, of the Republican Party and the military and the intelligence community, because later you saw these official uh, intelligence agencies uh, like the OSS and the CIA. And uh, now we know a lot more about the memberships and the membership of, of Skull and Bones and some of the rituals and, and it's it's quite freaky and dark and you should never underestimate the intelligence problem associated with this so most likely it was Britain behind this and um, 
Britain got itself entangled in communist circles and, and the revolution in Russia, uh, they got in, they got themselves involved somehow, and somehow you must consider them to be compromised. And um, if there's been so many examples, and I've mentioned this in a previous video, uh, Kim Philby, the big trader, or the atomic spies uh, like Klaus Fuchs or the Rosenbergs. So. Britain caused these massive intelligence failures for the Americans, and the Americans always had to deal with the consequences. And um, and this problem becomes even worse. Um, certain members of the royal family, which is in reality much, much larger than you see, uh, members of the family, such as Louis Mountbatten, they were considered a security threat. They got some. They were somehow compromised by the Soviets, and. Um, uh, Prince Michael of Kent, the cousin of the late queen, he was uh, he's involved with the Russians. And there are many more examples. And uh, the queen had access to all British information, as well as information that's uh, connected to uh, American networks and operations. So if she somehow decided to share intelligence with her family members, um, this opened up the door to all sorts of problems. And if Britain was compromised, severely compromised, then this problem could have extended to these old British networks in the United States. And uh, it was uh, groups like Skull and Bones, for example, which played a specific role in helping the young Soviet Union by um, facilitating technology sales and uh, appeasement and, and that sort of thing. And at a later stage, Skull and Bones did the same thing uh, for the Chinese, uh, communist Chinese. In the near future, I will assemble a book, an English book, uh, containing the best material uh, from the last, let's say, uh, 10 years. And uh, it's, it's very revealing, uh, and it finally explains a lot of these uh, very important issues. And um, it's, it's, it's super logical. And it's really well researched and there's quite a bit of um, uh, research done by other people here in Europe uh, in the last couple of years. Um, really, really interesting stuff, material that, that has never really made it to, to uh, the United States.